Amen. Let's pray together. We praise you, Father, for graciously revealing yourself to us in your word, Lord, and for sending us your Holy Spirit that empowers us with understanding, with greater clarity of your steadfast love through this word. So God, I pray that you would receive our worship, that you would meet with us, that you would teach us from your word. God, that you would strengthen our hearts, that you would make the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts to be acceptable in your sight. Through our rock and our redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask this in his precious name. Amen. I invite you to turn back into your Bibles to the book of Daniel chapter 4. And this chapter is probably one of the most fascinating in Scripture, for sure in the Old Testament, but I would dare say probably in all of the Scripture. This is the only chapter in which we find written by a pagan king who comes to praise and honor the one true God. And there is some confusion as to whether or not Nebuchadnezzar has come to faith in the one true God. I am among those who believe that, yes, indeed, he has. And I think as we make our way through this chapter, we'll see clearly why I believe that to be true. In fact, the first three verses and then the last verse of this chapter, it begins and it ends, it's bracketed by the praise to the holy God, the one true God. In fact, he calls him El Elyon. And we're going to see why that's important here as we make our way through this chapter. Lord willing, we'll do this entire chapter again today. We've been making our way chapter by chapter, and we hope to continue to do that. There are a few places that we're going to slow down, especially in Daniel chapter 9. Uh, we're going to take a couple of weeks at least as we look at Daniel chapter 9. But what I hope that we'll see from this chapter is that pride comes before the fall. And as we've named it today, pride comes before the crawl. Because what we're going to see is a story of a king, the most powerful man in the world at his time, and probably the most powerful man in the world even into our time today. We're going to see how he came from his glorious estate, as far as humans are concerned, and how he finds himself crawling on all fours like a wild beast. This is the ultimate story of pride and humility. And there are lessons for us to be learned here concerning our pride. Pride is that great... Uh, seed that's underneath every tree of sin that we can conceive. Pride was that sin that brought Lucifer to fall from his glorious estate there at, in the very presence of the Almighty God. It was pride that brought Eve into I and the tree of the forbidden fruit. It was pride that caused Adam to join her in her sin. It's been pride that's been behind every sin that we find in the, hu hu in the history of humanity. We want something because we think we deserve it. That's pride. We want more of something because we can't get enough. We can't be satisfied enough. That's pride. Pride is behind all of our sins. And so I hope that we'll pay attention today. And let's look now together as we see this proclamation of the king. There are five great truths here that we're going to talk about. In fact, every point in your handout, in your outline, they are all application points. These are all things that apply to us right now as we see from these various divisions in this chapter. And the first is those first three verses. Let's look at them together. I invite you to, to read along with me. I had to turn back a page. This is such a long chapter. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of all peoples, nations, and men of every language that live in all the earth. May your peace abound. It has seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. What we see here in this proclamation is that it is good to honor our great and sovereign God for sorrow that leads to repentance. And this is something that all of us should bank upon and be thankful for, that God would do such a work in our lives that he would move in order to bring us to a sorrowful place that we might repent. I know oftentimes we cry out, why God, right? Porque, we might say. 
And those words aren't bad. It's just the attitude and the inflection as we cry out to God. Instead of, why, God, why? We should be asking, why, God? What can I learn about you and about myself in this situation that I find myself in? It's not that the words are bad. It's that the affection of our heart is misplaced. And so we need to thank God for sorrow, for sorrow that brings us to repentance. And that's what we see in these first three verses. This is a praise that matches any other exaltation of God anywhere else in the Scripture. King Nebuchadnezzar is praising the one true God, much as the same as we find, again, throughout God's Word. He praises every, every bit as strongly and as affectionately as King David, as Solomon, as Paul. In that great doxology in Romans chapter 8, we see a praise that would rival even such as that. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. Now this chapter is about 40 years after chapter 2. That vision of chapter 2 that Nebuchadnezzar has from the Lord. That dream that he gives him to help him understand his place in history. As God begins to show him that his empire of gold is great indeed and there are other empires of humanity that will come after them and yet there is one empire, one kingdom, one king that will ultimately overcome and, 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 and just overshadow every other kingdom of man. And that's the kingdom of Jesus and none other than Jesus Christ himself. Amen? And so he has seen this. And again, he's had 40 years. And as we come to this place now, the Lord is once again giving him um, a chance to come to repentance. And we begin to see that here in these next few verses. In fact, I want you to, to look here with me at verses 4 through 7. We begin to see the vision of this great tree. And we read this a while ago, verses uh, 1 through 18. So we may not look at, I'm going to watch the clock. We may not reread every one of these verses in this opening part of the chapter. But we will absolutely see the highlights here together. But look with me at verses 4 through 7. 4 through 7. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and flourishing in my palace. And so what we have here now is a track, if you will, the personal testimony of King Nebuchadnezzar. And since this is a, a track, a decree from the king that goes out to all the peoples of his kingdom, and most likely it could have spread beyond his kingdom as well, but he is the most powerful king with the most um, splendid kingdom upon the earth in this time. And there were none that could rival him at this point. And therefore we see that he is uh, having this dream because he is at a time of peace and flourishing. Again, I was at ease in my house and flourishing in my palace. Now which palace was it? The Bible doesn't tell us. He had three palaces in his massive kingdom. He could have been at any one of these three. In one of the palaces there were the hanging gardens. One of the seven wonders of the world that King Nebuchadnezzar is responsible for having constructed. And so he's done much. He's rebuilt temples. He's rebuilt altars. He's rebuilt all, and these are pagan temples and pagan altars, but he's done so much in that part of the world. There were none who could rival him. And he's now been at peace. And again, this is about 40 years, 39 to 41 or so years since chapter 2 in that vision, that dream that came to him of the, the giant man out of the precious metals. So verse 5, he says, I saw a dream and it made me fearful. And these fantasies as I lay on my bed and the visions of my mind kept alarming me. So I gave orders to bring into my presence all the wise men of Babylon that they might make known to me the interpretations of the dream. So here we see that the king has another troubling dream. And once more we see that the king fails to remember who the one true God is. Now he's recounting the story of the state that he was in before coming to recognize who the one true God is, the Lord Most High. And so he's recounting that he does what he's always done. He depends upon his advisors. Now, were they any good to him before? No. Are they going to be good to him now? Absolutely not. And he's going to retell that part as well. Verses 4, excuse me, verses 8 through 18, he begins now to describe to them, to no avail, and then to Daniel finally, the dream. And so he tells him about this great tree that goes all the way up into the heavens. Now this had to be a cartoonish type of tree, right? Um, to reach that high. Just imagine how thin, how skinny it would be. But it goes up and it's got this great canopy that provides nourishment and shade for all of the creatures upon the whole of the earth. And so it's this great vision of this great tree. And what we see in here is that it is good when our sovereign God troubles our hearts to get our attention. That's what we see here. That's what this dream is about. God is graciously 
getting the attention of Nebuchadnezzar once again. And I say graciously because he's doing this for a reason. If you remember back from maybe the first week of our study, we saw in the book of Jeremiah where God, in his word, in the book of Jeremiah, calls Nebuchadnezzar his servant. He says, my servant Nebuchadnezzar at such a time, my servant Nebuchadnezzar did this and that. He, he calls him his servant. And this is why it's good that we see that this great and sovereign God of ours troubles us. God cares so much for us that he will do absolutely anything to get our attention. And that's what he does with Nebuchadnezzar here. And it shouldn't surprise us. We see this through book after book of Scripture. We see how Paul was brought to the end of himself and imprisoned and, and made very little in the eyes of the world so that God would be manifest tremendously and gloriously in his life. We have this perversion of Christianity, perversion of theology that says that God just wants to make us healthy and wealthy. The prosperity gospel runs rampant in America and we are exporting it overseas to our great shame and demise. But God wants us to know Him, and He wants us to be holy like the Christ. Amen? This is what God wants for us. And He will make us wealthy, or He will make us destitute in order that He gets our attention. Amen? He'll use our health, but He'll also use our sickness in order to make us know that we are not God and that He is. There can be none other. Only the Lord God. And so He troubles our hearts. And this is what He does for Nebuchadnezzar. It's an act of mercy. God's not picking on him, and some people think that. Why, God, why? Poor K, again, we ask, right? But God's not picking on him, and he doesn't pick on us. But he uses all things in order to make us more like Christ. He is using the troubles that we come through in life. And notice, we come through them in life, that we would be made more and more like Jesus. Now, here's what I want us to do. I want us to go ahead and jump down to verse 19, because we still have a lot of verses here to cover. But... Verses, again, 8 through 18, he's retelling the dream. And we're going to see it here as Daniel now interprets the dream. So the wise men of Babylon, all the Chaldeans and the wise men, all those guys, none of them could answer the dream. And this time they had a little cheat sheet, right? Not only did Nebuchadnezzar call them this time, but he told them the dream, and they still couldn't interpret the dream. They still couldn't do it. And they had the dream itself given to them, unlike in chapter 2 some 40 years prior. But now he recounts the dream, and Daniel is here. And so let's read in beginning here at verse, uh, verse 19. Verse 19. And we're going to read a long chunk here through verse 27. Then Daniel, whose name is Belteshazzar, was appalled for a while as his thoughts alarmed him. The king responded and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation alarm you. And Belteshazzar replied, My Lord, if only the dream applied to those who hate you and its interpretation to your adversaries. Now I want you to see what's happening here for a second. Is Daniel being sarcastic or snippy here? Is he saying, Oh, I want you to do well? <laughs> Not. No, this is genuine concern and affection for King Nebuchadnezzar. Now think about this. What had Nebuchadnezzar done some, you know, 43, 44 years prior? He had taken Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, right? Hananiah, Mishael, those guys. He had taken those young men and many other away from their families, away from their king, away from their kingdom, away from Jerusalem. He had taken them into captivity. They served the king of Babylon, who was the king of the whole world at that time. He was a king of all kings. And so he had every reason to despise him. But during this time, Daniel recognizes that he is sovereignly and purposefully and pointedly in the very spot that God wants him to be. And he knows why he's there. It's for those 70 years that, they had, uh, that Israel had failed to honor God and allow the land to rest. They owed God 70 years. Daniel knew full well why they were there. And so he doesn't complain and bellyache the whole time while he's there like we might be tempted to do. He takes every opportunity to give praise to God. Him, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, those men, those young men, what do they do? They proclaim the name of the one true God every opportunity they're given. And in the midst of that, he comes to have genuine concern for his king, Nebuchadnezzar. Even though he had been taken captive, he has, remember, he was elevated to be the number one spokesman, right, for all of the advisors. That's Daniel. He's basically like a, a political advisor 
Most likely, chapter 3, when he's missing, he's probably doing some work for King Nebuchadnezzar in another land. We can't say that definitively, but he's not there, so he's about the king's business in some, some fashion, some manner. But look back at verse 20 now. Daniel does not want this dream to apply to Nebuchadnezzar. And so he says, The tree that you saw, which became large and grew strong, whose height reached to the sky and was visible to all of the earth, whose foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and in whose branches the birds of the sky lodged. It is you, O king, for you have become great and grown strong, and your majesty has become great, and reached to the sky, and your dominion to the end of the earth. So he's saying, this is you, but I wish that it wasn't you. I mean, you're this great tree. It looks great, but hold on. It's not so great. Verse 23, and in that you saw an angelic watcher, a holy one descending from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it and yet leave the stump and its roots in the ground, but with a band of iron and bronze around it in the new grass of the field and let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and let him share with the beasts of the field until seven periods of time pass over him. So he's describing the dream and he's telling him what this dream is about. And so he says this tree is going to be chopped down at the command of God through an angel, one of the watchers, uh, an angelic watcher. Maybe it's a special type of angel, we can't really say. It's used very infrequently, but context would apply to the fact that this is an angel, some kind of angelic being that has this very purpose, to announce this decree from God. And so verse 24, Daniel says, this is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord, the king. Now just momentarily turn back to verse 17. Turn back to verse 17. When, Dan, when Nebuchadnezzar gets the dream, as he recounts the dream, notice what verse 17 says. This is what the watcher, the angelic being says. He says, the sentence this sentence is by decree from the angelic watchers, and the decision is a command of the holy ones, in order that the living may know. So here's the purpose of this vision and this dream. In order that the living may know, not just Nebuchadnezzar, but the living, that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind, and he bestows it upon whom he wishes, and he sets it over, and, excuse me, he sets it over the lowliest of men. So the angel said that this vision the point of this vision is that you and all of the world will know that there is one sovereign. It's not you. It's not all of y'all together, right? It's no one else. It's God. That he alone is the sovereign one. And he distributes power how he sees fit. Now think about that for a moment before we continue. He distributes power as he sees fit. That's what verse 17 tells us. He is the ruler and he bestows it upon whom he wishes. Bestows what? Power. And glory, he gives it. Now think about the various preceding election cycles that we have found ourselves in. No doubt, we've been joyous some years and we've been uh, downhearted other years, right? Through our presidential elections. But do you realize that there's no one in office, there never has been anyone in office in our nation or in any nation that is not there because God sovereignly bestowed power upon them? Either God is sovereign in all things or he's not. And if he's not sovereign in politics, he's not God. Amen? And so instead of complaining and bellyaching, why, God, why do we suffer under this president or that president or this speaker or that president? How about we start saying, what are you trying to teach us, God? What lesson do we need to learn? Why are we being seemingly judged by this type of leader today? What can we do to honor you, Lord God? That should be the heart of the Christian. Amen? That should be our response. And so what we're going to see here now in verses 19, 19 through 27 is that it is good when our great and only sovereign God exposes our sin and calls us to righteousness. And he'll do that. And he'll do whatever it takes in order to bring us to that point. Let's keep reading. He says... Let's see, where did I live, oh, leave off here? Verse 24, this is the interpretation. So we know the point and the purpose from verse 17. But now Daniel's going to give the meaning, the interpretation, O king. And this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord, the king, that you be driven away from mankind 
and your dwelling place be with the beasts of the field, and you be given grass to eat like cattle, and be drenched with the dew of heaven. And seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High, El Elyon, the Most High, is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Same thing the angel said in verse 17. Daniel is interpreting the very truth, the very fact. So not only the meaning, but the purpose once again. Verse 26, and in that it was commanded to leave the stump with the roots and the tree, your kingdom will be assured to you after you recognize that it is heaven that rules. So it's heaven, God's domain, and God himself who rule. Therefore, O king, may my advice be pleasing to you. Now notice what Daniel does here. Daniel is not interpreting the dream any longer. This is not, thus saith the Lord. This is Daniel's heart for his king. Even though he was a pagan king, and even though historically he was a horrendous and brutal man. Notice what Daniel says. Here is what I want for you. Here is my advice. And may it be pleasing to you. Break away now from your sins by doing righteousness and from your iniquities, another word for sin, right? By showing mercy to the poor in case there may be a prolonging of your prosperity. So he says, repent. Come to see God and who he is, El Elyon. Come to see the Lord Most High. Bow to him, repent, humble yourself before him that he might show you mercy and prosperity. This is what Daniel wants for him. And so again, it's good when God exposes our sin and calls us to righteousness. What has God done for you or to you in order to bring about sin's recognition in your own life? I know it's easy to point out other people's sin, right? We, we do that naturally. Can you believe what Shane did Tuesday, for instance? I'm just picking on you, but, but it's easy for us to do that. You'll never guess what Alan said last week, that sort of thing, right? But it's so easy to see it in someone else. That's why Jesus said something about getting that what out of our eye? That log, so that we can clearly see what's going on. It's easy to see it, but why is it so difficult to see it in ourselves from times? Thank God that he brings it to our attention, amen? Thank God for the opportunity to repent, amen? Thank God when he gets our attention. And sometimes, painfully, he uses other people to do that. And it's better when he just convicts you and you take care of it, just you and God. It's a little more difficult when other people get involved, right? Because, you know, the humility begins to yeah, replace the pride and the pride has to be swallowed and done away with. And, and that's hard for us. That's hard for us. But thank God when he exposes our sin, amen? And thank God that he'll go to extreme measures to do so. The sorrow that leads to repentance, he'll trouble our heart to get our attention, and he will indeed expose sin in us and call us to repentance. It amazes me that people who profess Christ, that profess to be Christian, can just outright blatantly sin and be okay with that. They can just outright say things, some of the most absurd things, like, I don't need church for instance, I'm okay, just me and God. That's, we're a majority, right? I don't need anyone else. When throughout the scripture, it tells us to one another, one another, amen? We need one another. You may think, and I may think, we don't need one another, but stay away long enough, and before long, you are engrossed in sins. In fact, oftentimes the very sin that once appalled us, we now find pleasing, like the coal. I keep coming back to this. You take the coal from the midst of the other coals in the flame and set it apart by itself. It goes out much quicker than the others ever do. We're not made to be alone. We need one another. So thank God when he exposes sin and calls us to righteousness. God used Daniel to help get Nebuchadnezzar's attention. Thank God when other people call us on our sin. Amen? And not just to point at us, but to pray with us and to help us. That's the, some of you are going, ooh, I get to point out people's sin. No, you want to do so in order to bring them to repentance, not to neener, neener, neener them. Just write in whatever definition of neener, neener, neener you need to, right? That's not the goal. The goal is restoration. And so we begin to see that as this chapter comes. And, and, and just again, I just want to highlight Daniel here in verse 27. He says, please, may my advice be acceptable to you. Turn away now, break away. And to break away is violent. Cut it off, stop completely. Put a big chasm between you and your sin. Take extreme measures. 
It's not just add some good things to your sin, but it takes me back to Ephesians 4, 22, 23, and 24. Put off sin. Change your thinking. Put on righteous behavior. Amen? The put off, renew, put on principle. It's so applicable to us in Christ. This is really the ideal here that Daniel is sharing with Nebuchadnezzar. So I have to ask myself as way of application here, and painfully so, am I praying for our leaders this way today? And if we all had to confess today, what would our confession most likely be? No, not really. Definitely not like we should. I mean, I pray those impeccatory prayers, you know. God, I call down fire into Washington. I mean, those come pretty easy right now, right? Those are fun. Those impeccatory, you know, asking for God's judgment for them, but not for us. Well, that's fun. That's easy. But are we asking God to bless those who lead our nation? Well, I didn't vote for them. All the more reason to pray for the leaders of our nation. God is never not sovereign. He can't be unsovereign. I'm just making up words today, right? But I think you get the point. He's either in control or he's not. And so if we have a president, even maybe if we don't like the president or the speaker, whoever it might be, God's either still sovereign or he never was to begin with. He can't be unsovereign. Amen? Amen? Amen. And so let's pray. Let's learn. Let's pray. Let's honor the king. Let's honor the king. That's what Daniel does here. Now, look at these next few verses. Look at verses 28 through 33. We see the vision is fulfilled here. So the king comes. He has the vision. He retells the vision. Daniel interprets the vision. And now the vision is fulfilled. The vision is fulfilled. But notice, all this happened to Nebuchadnezzar the king. I love Nebuchadnezzar's telling the story. The first three verses in the end, it's I... Right, And there's several I's and me's and all these things throughout here. But the main thrust of this, this story, he's telling it in the third person. He's telling this to the whole kingdom. This is his testimony, his track that goes out to all of the kingdom. Remember what he had said before. Everybody, remember in chapter 3, this edict went out to the whole kingdom. Everybody has to bow down to this big image of me. Right? Can you imagine how confused they were when they received another edict from the king? Because this track is law. Anything the king said and had put to pen was law. And now he's telling them what? To worship the one true God. Can you imagine the confusion? But no doubt, some people believed. That's how, how our God works. He's awesome like that. He'll take a humble testimony. And this is truly a humble testimony. This was a prideful man, an arrogant beast of a man. And now all this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 29, 12 months later, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. So he's on one of the palaces. There's three. He's on the rooftop of one. Twelve months. He's had twelve months of grace. Twelve months of mercy. Twelve months where God pauses judgment in order for him to repent. Aren't you grateful for our patient God? He's not slow, right? He wants all to come to repentance, we read in Peter. This is our God. And the king reflected and said, Is this not Babylon the Great? And he's not wrong. It was Babylon the Great. But here's the problem. Which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty. Who gave power to Nebuchadnezzar? God. The one true God. And he has still failed to recognize that. So while the word was in the king's mouth, a voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been removed from you, and you will be driven away from mankind, and your dwelling place will be with the beast of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle, and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes. Immediately. The word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from mankind and began eating grass like cattle. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Now, what a picture. And this may be so graphically and so, so detailed of a description that we think, ah, oh, no, that's just for emphasis. But what it's telling us is that he is gone. Now, this is seven years. No bath. Right? No haircut, no uh, manicure. I forgot the name of that word for just a moment, but no manicure, pedicure, none of those things. So he is a beast of a man, just like God had foretold would happen. 
he will become a beast. The mind of a man taken, and it will be replaced with the mind of a beast. And we may have psychological terms for those sorts of things, and there are a variety of terms when people think they're cattle, much like what Nebuchadnezzar was doing here. They could think they're a dog or different things. Uh, there's even a word for when humans think they're pigs. Uh, there's all sorts of labels. And if you want to just have some great reading, read the, di uh, the DSM-5. That's the latest psychological, um, I guess, uh, definition book, right? The official book of psychiatry that describes all of the elements that we've invented. All, the, all of the um, elements that we try to redefine sin with. That's really what it is. The DSM-5. There's been five versions. You just keep adding to it. Just keep adding to it. They're re rewriting it right now so that we can put transphobia kind of language in it right now too uh, because that's a new problem that has to be addressed. You have brain damage if you cannot accept everyone, uh, everyone's lifestyle. That's basically what the DSM-6 will say. So what do we do? What do we do? We have to thank God when he humbles us, when we are arrogant and prideful. That's number four. The king is so full of himself. He's full of himself. Look what I have done. Look at my land, my kingdom, my palace. And you think, that's, that's a great story, but, but we don't ever do that. Absolutely false. We do this a lot more than we think. I deserve this raise. Look at my flower garden. Look at my neighbor's weeds. But look at my well-manicured lawn. I mean, that's silly, right? But that is the same root of pride that Nebuchadnezzar struggled with. Look at my hair. Look at my nails, Craig. Look at whatever it might be. Craig was picking on my hair earlier. So, pride. Oh, no. Pride. It is funny, but it's also sad. It's also sad because we all wrestle with pride to various degrees. We spend more time in front of a mirror or more time in a gymnasium or a, a weight room than we do in God's Word because pride. The outside is more important, we think, than what's inside. Shame on us, Christians. Amen? So thank God when He humbles us in the midst of our arrogant and our pride. So that is the fulfillment of the vision, and it happens. And, and you know, people doubted this for so long, and, and there's a lot of um, despairing remarks that have been made about the book of Daniel, and especially when we date it accurately uh, to the time period that it was actually written, some 600 years prior to the time of Christ. Uh, a lot of people in the church even try to date it within one to 200 years of Christ, and that's categorically false. It was already translated into the Septuagint uh, in the Greek language well before that later date. Uh, it was, it's completely false. It's, it's, it's not possible in any way that it has this young date. His, history just does not allow that to happen. But what we have now seen in the historical records is that Nebuchadnezzar was a real king. There have been stones that have been uncovered, pottery that have been uncovered, pieces of, of construct that have been uncovered that bear witness to his name, coinage that has been discovered. There is so, in fact, there's more evidence for Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel than there was for George Washington. I mean, it's a fact. Much more evidence to prove he is a historical person. And as we're going to see next week in chapter 5, to look at his lineage and his genealogy, chapter 5 takes place about 23 years after this chapter does, after Nebuchadnezzar's death. He's an old man at this point, but he comes to recognize the one true God. He's been humbled, and he's been humbled in a way, in a fashion that none of us have experienced yet. We think we've had it bad, and when you think that, just go back and look at Nebuchadnezzar. He's on all fours. He's eating grass, right? Not the good kind either. I don't know what that would be. Don't read anything drug-related into that. That wasn't the point. Wasn't the point. I don't know what I meant by that. <laughs> Digging that hole. Let me just get on here. Let's look at the rest of the chapter. Where are we at? Verse 34. Let's look at the end. This is the result, and this is just fascinating. This is glorious. Please pay attention to these verses. But at the end of that period, so seven years have gone by, and people used to wonder, how could this have happened? How could Nebuchadnezzar not been in power for seven years and then come back and be restored to the same thing? The Bible doesn't tell us how other than by the decree of God. That much we know. But historically looking back, you can see that this is fact, that he disappears for seven years. There are, are um, 
uh, historic documents that point to the fact that Nebuchadnezzar vanishes. They think he's vacationing at one of his palaces on the coast. And there are other people that were leading the kingdom. And then he comes back and he is instantly restored. That does not happen by man's standard. That does not happen according to our power and our say. That is only by God. I mean, you leave a, vo- a vacancy for seven years, someone's going to fill the void. And someone's going to like the, the power that they've accumulated, that they've taken over. But that is not the case. And we can only say it's by the grace of God. And so he says, at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raise my eyes toward heaven and my reason returned to me. So he raises his eyes, his reason comes back so that animal beast-like mind is gone. And now the, the man's mind comes back to him. He said, my reason returned to me and I blessed the most high and praised and honored him who lives forever. Folks, again, these words are ever bit as potent as anyone else's testimony about our God. Amen? And he says, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion. Nebuchadnezzar had said, look at my kingdom. Look at what I've done. But now he says, God's kingdom is everlasting. His will last forever. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. Nebuchadnezzar had no guarantee that his kingdom would continue. In fact, it's not going to. It's very short-lived after this. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. Now, do you think he included himself in that, that word all? Guess what all means? It means all. So all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. But he, meaning God, does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? For gay again, right? Nobody can say that. I'm hooked on that. That's about one of the only Spanish words I can remember right now. So, um, Alan's tried. It's just hard for an old dog to learn a new language. But no one, no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? Look at verse 36. And that time my reason returned to me and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom. And my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out. So I was reestablished in my sovereignty and surpassing greatness was added to me. So not only did he get his kingdom back, but the end of his rule was better than it had been before. There was more peace, more abundance, more pleasure, more, more um, surpassing greatness added to him. And then notice this last verse. Love this verse. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven. So notice. All this stuff happened to him, got his attention. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven. For all his works are true and his ways just. And he is able to humble those who walk in pride. Testimony right there. Amen? Tremendous testimony. The most fierce, just, I mean, savage king in his day has become humbled. He was made like a beast for seven years. God humbles him, but he lifts his eyes to heaven and he says, you're God and I'm not. That's the paraphrase version. You're God and I'm not. And that's why I'm telling you, that's why I believe and most commentators throughout history from the very early ages of the church, most commentators believe that we will see Nebuchadnezzar in eternity. Now, can we say that for sure? No, I'm not saying that for sure. But I believe that his testimony is ever bit as potent as mine or yours or anyone else's. And so what do we see here? Well, it's good to praise God because he always does what is right. We can praise God because he always does what is right. You know, when God is putting us through something, some trial, some heartache, some, something difficult, when he's doing it for his reasons to make us recognize him, that he's God, that we're not, in order to get our attention, that we will glorify him, that we'll glory in him and not in our own accomplishments, right? When he's doing those things, it's hard in the midst to give him his due credit. But afterwards, we have the luxury, thank God, we look back and we're like, huh, Now I see what God was up to. It's good. He always does what is right. And so if you've been through something, in fact, I'm just going to ask, how many of you have been through something trying and you just wondered where could God be in that? Anybody else? But now you're on the other side. You look back. Do you see what God has done? Do you see what what, what he was up to? Making us more like Christ. We have that opportunity. Every moment is grace from God. Amen. And so we can thank God. He always does, does what is right. And so for those of us who have now exposed ourselves, that yes, we've had that happen. Yes, we see God for who he is. How can we still doubt when the next bad thing happens? Are you guilty of that too? We still, we still just for some reason, we, we think God's not as strong anymore as he was. He is almighty God, the Lord most high. 
And so let me just give you, I mean, that's five things that we can praise God for. Sorrow that brings us to repentance, troubles that get our attention, when he exposes our sin to bring us unto righteousness, when he humbles us when we're arrogant and prideful, and just remembering that he always does what's right. We can be certain. This is some bonus, if you will. This is the sprinkles on top of the, the icing, right? We can be certain that God's judgment, though it may be slow, it is certain. Though it's slow, it's certain. He is always going to keep his word. He will always do that. And we should never think that his silence then is approval for sin and for our wickedness. We get away with something, so we think. And we think, aha, I'm going to do that again. God must not have a problem with that after all. That's dangerous territory, amen? Those are shark-infested waters that you are finding yourself in. Just because he is slow does not mean it's not certain. God gave Nebuchadnezzar 12 full months before he brought the hammer of judgment. He may be doing the same for us. Therefore, we should repent now, amen? Repent. What hidden sin? On the count of three, let's all call them out. You ready? What hidden sin have you been? Don't do that. But some of you got real nervous just then. Oh, no. I really have to do that? No, you don't have to do that. But if you got nervous, you may want to bow your heads and begin to do a little heart check with God right now. Amen? What sin am I holding on to? What is it that I'm holding on to that I, I think God's okay with? You know that he's not. So deal with it. Repent. Amen? Be sure of this also. So we're certain that judgment is certain. We can be sure that God will cut us down to turn us around. I like how that's worded. That was kind of fun. He will cut us down to turn us around. He will do anything to make us holy. And that's for our good and our benefit ultimately, amen? He wants to accomplish his will, his plans, his desires in us. That's what he did for Nebuchadnezzar. Thank God that he has not driven us mad like a wild beast yet. Now, some of us act that way sometimes, but this has not happened to any of us to this degree. Does that mean it's just a fable? It's just a made-up story? It's an allegory? No, this is a true story. Jesus himself refers to the writings of Daniel as fact in the book of Matthew. So be careful. Be careful. God's word can be repeatedly heard but not heeded. Nebuchadnezzar had heard for years and years and years and years. Some 40 years plus he had heard from Daniel. Daniel is his right-hand man, the number one advisor, proclaiming the one true God. No doubt there's been more exchanges even than what we've seen here. And we would infer from what we know about Daniel, what um, Jesus even says about him, He's the beloved of the Old Testament. Only one other person called this, and that's John in the New Testament. And these two men are privy to having a panoramic view of, of, of history. All of what's happened in the past, all the way up to the new heaven and the new earth. Daniel and John, only two men who see it in its totality in this way. And they're both called beloved of God. We can believe what he says, and we can know that when God's word is repeatedly heard, it may not necessarily be heeded. And so we need to be, be um, soft to that possibility. Just because we know a whole lot of word doesn't mean we're obeying all of God's word. Amen? And we need to make sure it's not just a matter of facts up here, but it's a matter of, of our being down here. Amen? It's supposed to change us. Now be warned, pride will be driven from God's people. Fact. If you're prideful, you're sinning. If I'm prideful, I'm sinning. Let me rephrase that. When I'm prideful and when you're prideful, we are sinning. Amen? Proverbs 8.13. The fear of Yahweh is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance in the evil way and the perverted mouth I hate, says God. Pride, arrogance, perversion, evil, he says. Jeremiah 9, verses 23 and 24. Jeremiah 9, verses 23 and 24. Thus says Yahweh, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts, boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord. I am Yahweh who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For I delight in these things, declares Yahweh, the sovereign God. Amen? This is what we are to delight in. Jesus said in Luke 18, verses 13 and 14, 
For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. The context there is between the Pharisee and the tax collector. Remember the Pharisee comes up and he says, oh, thank God that I'm not like these others here. Look at me. And he's pulling his collar up right and fixing his tie and, and he's arrogant and prideful. Thank you that I am not like these other people. And verse 13 says, the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift his eyes up to heaven and was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And look what Jesus says. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the Pharisee, the religious leader. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. So where are we, Christians? Is there a remnant of pride that has so consumed us that is discounting our walk in the eyes of the world, that is discrediting our God because we are smudged, our light doesn't shine forth the way it's supposed to. We need to repent of that, amen? Have we bowed before King Jesus and said, God, be merciful to me, I've sinned. Is that true of us today? If it is, we should do business with God right now. We should cry out to God, oh God, be merciful to me. I've sinned. I've sinned before you, the holy God. And here's the reality. Even, of the, even those blatant agnostics that say we can't know, those atheists that says they do know, how arrogant is that? To say they know everything there is to know about everything, and so they've determined that there is no God. That is the epitome of pride and arrogance. Amen? But one day they will recognize that God is real. The Bible tells us such. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, the Bible says this, At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. All God's people say, Amen. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord God, that we're able to see because of this word how sinful we are. That, Father, because of the truth of your word, we're able to hold ourselves up to this mirror of the word and we're able to recognize the sin in our own lives. May it be easy for us to see. In fact, may it be easier for us to see our own sin, the log in our own eye rather than the speck in our brother or our sister's. God, would you bring us to the tent, bring, a, bring, bring us to be at a tent of the fact that we have sin. And where we are prideful and arrogant, Lord, may we repent. May we cast off those shackles of sin. May we glory, may we boast in Jesus Christ. May we do as the scripture says, and not arrogantly think that we're owed anything, that we're guaranteed anything, Lord. But may we learn to say, if it's your will, we will go up tomorrow morning. If it's your will, we will work tomorrow. If it's your will, we'll be on summer break from school tomorrow. If it's your will, we will do this or that. May we recognize that you hold our lives in your hand. That we are dust. That you are creator. Sovereign Creator, the Most High God. And there is none other like you. I pray that that would be the praise of our lips, much like it was on the lips of Nebuchadnezzar late in his life. I pray that that would be our testament, our testimony, that we serve the Most High God. Everything we have is from His gracious hand. Trouble from God to make us holy. Blessing from God to make us holy, to make us trust, to make us thankful. But it's all from you, O oh God. May that be ever true in our lives. May we as a church continue to humble ourselves and to seek your face, O oh God. And still, O oh God of Jacob, because you are the everlasting one, and Jacob lives because of you. We don't cease to exist. So we rejoice in the facts of those songs that we sang right from Psalm 24 today. Thank you, Father, for lips, for a tongue, for a voice to praise, for heart's affection, mind's attention, Lord God, that we can do right by you. And so we thank you, Lord. And I pray that if there's someone here struggling, Lord, and I know life is hard at times for us, 
And I think, Lord God, that your word is factual and true and it's gonna get more difficult in many ways for Christians, for those who are truly saved. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll be gracious to us, that, God, you would smile upon these precious folks, that your hand would be upon them, that you would be gracious unto them, that you'd give them peace, Lord God, in the midst of harrowing times. But, Father, for those who are hurting today, through fault of their own or the fault of others. God, I pray comfort right now. And I know several people are struggling with some very serious issues, Lord. But Father, we know that you are good. And so even in these difficult things, may they be brought to a place where they can say, God, you're still good. God, I still love you. And I know that you will bring me through this valley in your timing, in your way, God. I trust you now. We ask these things in Christ Jesus' holy name.